Would you take God's Word this morning and would you open to the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 14, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14 this morning, Philippians chapter 2 verse 14, and uh, I'm going to let, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Thank you so much. You may be seated. May God bless us this morning and give us attentive hearts as we hear God's word. This is God's inspired, authoritative word, and we get the privilege of studying it. Uh, Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the privilege we have of worshiping here. And part of that worship is the way in which we listen and we give reverence to the Word of God. And Father, help me to make it very clear. Help me, Lord, to uh, preach Christ. And Lord, may you do your work of sanctification. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been doing just a short series here recently on God's answer to anxiety. And I want to continue with that here in the book of Philippians and this passage this morning. We live in a society that loves to complain. And the irony is, is that we are the most indulgent society in the world, yet we're also the most discontented. The more people have, the more discontented they are with what they have. And these type of people don't suffer in silence. We seem to be breeding a generation of complainers. And complaining has a a very negative effect on the individual with regard to this issue of anxiety. It's no accident that the people who complain the most are the ones that seem to suffer from anxiety the most. Complaining has a negative effect on you as a person. Uh, it might feel good at first. It might, in a sense, you may think complaining provides a sense of relief, but really it's all placebo. It, 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 in other words, uh, it's really doing much more harm than it is good when you resort to complaining. It breeds negativity. Uh, You encourage other people to complain. You encourage other people to have a negative outlook. In the Bible, uh, the Bible describes apostates in the book of Jude as those who are grumblers, those who find fault. And complaining is just an unhealthy coping mechanism. We learned last time when we studied Philippians that Paul said that we are to replace negative thoughts with scriptural meditation. But complaining does the exact opposite. Complaining focuses on the negative. And what it does then is it increases anxiety and depression. It it, it might feel at first like when you complain, you're actually relieving yourself of anxiety, but actually you're doing the exact opposite because every time you complain, you're kind of reliving the situation and all the emotions, all the negative emotions that go with it. And so basically what it does is it trains your brain to be negative. If you respond to situations in your life that upset you with complaining, you are training and conditioning yourself to complain and be negative all the time. And this brings forth more situations to complain about. It kind of brings kind of a vicious cycle of just constantly complaining. But the worst thing about it is that complaining is a sin against God. It's a sin against God. You're in essence complaining about the God who in his sovereignty placed you in that circumstance of your life. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Romans 9.20, Who are you, O man, who answers back to God? Who are you to complain about the situation that God has put you in? Well, the thing that molded say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Complaining against God is out of place. It is inappropriate. It is a lack of thankfulness. It is a lack of contentment in what God is trying to do in your life. So Paul writes to the Philippians about this very thing. We just read in chapter 2, verse 14, do all things without murmuring and disputings. Now let me remind you about this Philippian church. They were going through a lot of difficulty. If you were with us on our last time, 
You remember I mentioned the fact that they were in poverty. The Apostle Paul mentions the believers in Macedonia in 2 Corinthians. This was the Philippian church. And he said that he talked about their great trial of affliction. He talked about their destitute poverty, their deep poverty. And part of the reason for that is they had suffered through a Roman civil war. One of the great civil wars fought by Romans was fought right there at that little city at Philippi. It's called the, uh, the War of Philippi. It was between Caesar and Pompey. We're talking about 200,000 soldiers. 40,000 people were killed in that battle. And uh, it, it, it left the land devastated, that war. And it left people impoverished as well. In addition, the Roman government was taking money from them. They were taking taxes from the people. And these, these people were just in deep poverty, the Bible says. But add to that the fact that they were under severe persecution. They were experiencing this because of the Romans that were left behind there, because of so many Roman soldiers fighting in that battle. Many of them stayed there at Philippi, and the little city became a Roman colony. So they had Roman culture, Roman laws, Roman dress, and also Roman perversity, we could say. They were, the Romans there were living ungodly lives. The Apostle Paul in verse number 5 said that they were to be blameless and harmless in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And he was referring to the situation that they were in. They were living among pagan, ungodly people. And add to that the fact that they were also fighting false teaching in the church, and there was division in the church where there were some people that could not get along. And so they were in a very stressful circumstance. But the Apostle Paul, in light of all of this, the Apostle Paul, what does he say to them? He gives them a command And verse number 14, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Now, if anyone had the right to say this, it was Paul. I mean, you remember the situation that Paul was in? When he wrote this letter, he was in a Roman prison, and he was facing difficulty himself. He was going to stand before Caesar. Caesar very well could put him to death, or he could let him live, or Paul could get sick in that prison or die of starvation. He was in a very difficult circumstance. You would think that Paul himself would be complaining or stressed out, but in fact, it's the exact opposite. What we learned, and we talked about this last week, that the book of Philippians, the major theme of it is joy. He talks about rejoicing. He talks about joy. Several times he commands the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord, always. And again, I say rejoice. And then he gives this command, and the command is stop complaining. Whatever situation you find yourself in, stop complaining. This is an imperative, present tense, continual. You don't have a reason to complain. If you're complaining, stop doing that. Now, in the context, he's especially exhorting us against grumbling and disputing against one another in the church. Because again, the church of Philippi, there were some things going on there. There were some women that could not get along. In chapter 4, verse 2, he says, I beseech Yodius and I beseech Synergy that they be of the same mind in the Lord. One uh, preacher pronounced their name, you owe me, and so touchy. They couldn't get along there in the church. But Paul had just, in chapter 2, been exhorting the Philippians to live, to have the mind of Christ, who is very selfless. And so Paul's exhortation continues on here with a command to not complain. I don't know about you, but I struggle with this at times, to my shame. There are times when things don't go my way that I I begin to complain about it. It's a law for me that I always get in the wrong line in stores. That always happens to me. You know, there's five lines. I choose the one that is the slowest. It happens every time. When I'm out driving on the road, I'm always behind the slowest person. And, uh, you know, if if the right lane is moving quicker, I get into the right lane, all of a sudden the right lane starts moving slow. And the left two lanes start moving quick. Whatever lane I get in, it starts to slow down, you know. Now, God does that to me on purpose because he's teaching me, look, stop complaining. Stop complaining about these little irritations. Stop complaining about these things in your life that are not going your way. Notice two words here in verse number 14 where it says murmurings. That's a a word that it's designed to make a sound, you know. You ever watch Batman growing up? And when he would hit a guy, there would be a a word across the screen that said, bam, or pow, you know, that's onomatopoeia, 
a literary device where the word is designed to make a sound, and that's what the word is here. It's a word really designed to say grumble, grumble, grumble. It's a grumbling type word. It's used to talk about the complaining of Israel. This is an outward grumbling, an outward complaining. And then again in verse number 14, we see the word disputing, dialogimas. That is to reason through in your mind. This is kind of an inward complaining. You know, sometimes our complaining is verbal. It's outward. Sometimes we complain. We're not saying anything, but it's our spirit. It's our attitude that's complaining on the inside. You can complain without really saying anything. I heard about a monk who joined a monastery. He took a vow of silence. Every 10 years, he was allowed to say two words. After the first 10 years, his superiors called him in. He said, you get two words. He said, My two wor- the two words were food bad. <laughs> 10 years later, he got to come back in and say two more words. His two words were bed hard. After another 10 years, he came in. He gave two more words. His two words were I quit. <laughs> his superior said, well, I, I'm not surprised that you quit. You've been nothing, doing nothing of the complaining since you've been here. But, you know, you don't have to speak to complain. God can hear your thoughts. He knows what you're thinking. He knows your inward attitude. It's more than just an outward expression. At the, at the root of it, it's a lack of submission. It's a lack of submission to the sovereign will of God in your life, to the lordship of Christ in your life. So Paul says do. That is, you know, this is a constant command. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Look at the word all things there. I wish Paul had been a bit more realistic and down to earth. I mean, he could have said do most things without grumbling or disputing. But he didn't say most things. He said do all things without murmuring and disputing. Paul isn't going to let us off the hook here. And you know why God says do all things without complaining? Because we have nothing to complain about. Listen to Lamentations 3.39. Write this down because you might want to go back to it. Two little lines. Why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? Think about that. Who in the world are we to complain in view of our sins to God? And in view of the fact that God has forgiven us of our sins. You know what I deserve? I deserve hell. I deserve the wrath of God. But God in his mercy has forgiven me. I have nothing to complain about. And neither does any person that's a child of God or anyone for that matter. Someone said the trouble with the world is we have too many people who begin their sentence with with the trouble with the world is. Now, if you read through Scripture, you'll find one thing for certain. God hates complaining. He hates it. So I want to give you in our passage here five reasons to not complain. And I think that by adopting this guideline for our life, this standard for our life, it helps us to attack anxiety. We avoid anxiety. We only make it worse when we complain. And Paul's trying to teach us to change our attitude. So notice five reasons to stop complaining. Number one, complaining dishonors your father. Look at verse number 15, that you might be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. Now, when Paul uses this phrase, sons of God or children of God, he's reflecting back to an Old Testament passage. Behind that, those words there, Paul is referring to or alluding to Deuteronomy 32, verse number 5. And it says this in Deuteronomy 32, 5, they have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. And that was referring to the children of Israel at that time. They were not acting like children of God. They were grumbling about everything. And God had done all these wonderful things for the nation of Israel. And yet the people in it were still complaining. In Psalm 106, verse 25 It says this, they murmured in their tents, and they did not obey the voice of the Lord. So in this song of Moses, Moses is referring to the grumbling and complaining of the children of Israel while they were in the wilderness. And if you go back to the Old Testament, what you'll find is a lot of passages that talk about this. In Exodus 14, 11, they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away in the wilderness to die? Moses, did you bring us out here just to kill us? In Exodus 15, 24, and the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? They were constantly complaining 
to Moses. They were complaining about Moses, some of the things that he did that they didn't like. In Exodus 16, 2, the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses, it says, and Aaron. In Exodus 17, 3, and the people complained. And it doesn't end there. In fact, take your Bible. Go back to Numbers chapter four, uh, 14, will you please? Or actually, go back to Numbers 13. We'll look at the last few verses in Numbers 13. And then I want you to look in uh, verses the beginning of chapter 14. And Moses is speaking about what was going on here when he wrote Numbers in this situation. It says this in verse 31 of Numbers 13, but the men went up with him, that went up with him said, we be not able to go against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they searched under the children of Israel saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is the land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. And look at chapter 14, look at verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would to God that we had died in this wilderness? So what happens here? This is the part where Moses sent 12 spies into the promised land, kind of spied out to see what the land was like. While they were there, they saw these giants. They saw that the land was everything that God said it was, a land that flowed with milk and honey, a land that was rich. But they also saw these giants. And while Joshua and Caleb gave a a faith-filled report, said, look, we're able to take this land, the other 10 spies, filled with fear and anxiety, they begin to complain. And their complaining was contagious, so much so that all the children of Israel murmured. And because of this complaining, God was ready to destroy the children of Israel right there in the wilderness. These 10 spies were prophets of doom, and they, their, their complaining was contagious, and they kicked off a nationwide discontent by complaining about what God had commanded them to do. But drop down to Numbers chapter 14, look at verse number 35, I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Verse 36, and the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land. Even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. Shows you what God thinks about complaining. What happened to those men? God took them. He killed them. And this, you would think that this would solve the problem. But what you find out is that it didn't. Again, they, they complain in Numbers chapter 20 and in chapter 21. They just continue to p- complain. And later on in the New Testament, Paul will write and say, look, we need to re- remember that example. We need to learn from their mistake because they complained and they were destroyed by the destroyer. We need to learn from that. Their complaining demonstrated a lack of gratitude on God's blessing. It demonstrated a lack of confidence in God's wisdom, a lack of trust in God's ways. And so in Deuteronomy 32.5, Moses is basically saying, look, he's remembering all the complaining, and God is saying there in that verse, these are not my children because my children don't murmur. My children don't complain. That's not the way my children are to act. So the idea here is is that if you are a child of God, your attitude reflects your heavenly Father. What what kind of attitude do you show to the world that your God is? If they see someone who's always complaining, then they're going to ask, what do you have that I need? If you're complaining about your God, that is a terrible witness. That's a terrible reflection on God, you know, To swear is a wicked thing because it takes God's name in vain, but to complain is likewise wicked because it takes God's goodness and his wisdom in vain. So complaining dishonors your father, but here's number two. Complaining dims your testimony. Look at verse number. Go back to Philippians chapter 2 and look at verse number 15. 
again, that you might be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Notice, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation or generation. And Paul is using a metaphor for the Christian. <clears throat> He's kind of using a metaphor from the world of astronomy. God's people are to be like lights shining against the dark night. You know, while Jesus came to this world, he was the light of the world, right? He was the light that shone in the darkness. But you know what? He went back to heaven. You know who the lights of the world are now? It's God's people. Because when we get saved, Jesus lives in us. And the light that people see in us is not our own light because we have no light of our own. The light that people see in us as God's children is the light of God. It's Christ in us. And when people see Christ in us, you know what happens? God is glorified. We're here to exalt God. We're here to magnify him before a lost and dying world. What does it mean to glorify God? It means to make him look good. Now, God already is good. He already is glorious. We just simply bring that fact down to life in the way that we live. We are to glorify God. And so, in order for a star, this is the image that he's giving here. We're like stars against the dark night. In order for a star to really shine, it has to be set against darkness. It's no accident that you're here, that God has left you in this dark world. It's because he wants you to shine as lights. You say, man, you know, where I live, you know, it's really, it's really difficult. I know God puts you there because you're the light that's supposed to shine in the darkness. It always <clears throat> amazes me about people that they want to move and find their happy place, their Shangri-La, where there, everything is good. There's no place like that in the world. This is a crooked, dark, perverse world, and sin is everywhere, beloved. There is no safe spot. There is no spot where it's, you know, okay, where everything is great. God left us in this world, this crooked and perverse world, because he wants us to be the light in this dark world. How can we do that if we are not if we're not thankful, if we're always complaining like the Israelites did. That's Paul's whole point here. If we don't shine the light of Christ in our attitude and the way that we live, then we are dim, we are, our testimony for Christ is dim. You can't whine and shine at the same time. So that's the next thing that we see here. And by the way, Paul's the greatest example of this. I showed you this last week, but I want you to see it again. Remember, where is Paul? He's in a prison, right? And he's in a difficult circumstance. But Paul's not complaining. He's not whining. He's not filled with anxiety. In fact, he's filled with joy. And why? Because he sees opportunities of being in that prison. Look in chapter 1. Look at verse number 12 again. But I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So what's he saying? Me being in prison, it's causing the gospel to spread up into the upper echelons of the Roman government. Roman soldiers are getting saved. Also, people know that I'm in prison. It's actually giving them courage to speak for Christ. And Paul also knew that it was perfecting his character, it was working on his own sanctification. So he was filled with joy. He wasn't complaining about his circumstance. Here's the third thing. Complaining dishonors your father. Complaining dims your testimony. But also, number three, complaining destroys your witness. Look at verse number 16 of chapter 2. Notice what he says. Holding forth the word of life that I might rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Holding forth the word of life. What's the word of life there? It's the gospel. As God's people, we are to hold forth the gospel. We're to hold forth the word of life. That's the idea here. Every person here that is saved, that knows Jesus Christ, it is your responsibility to hold forth the word of life. That's what you're to do. Did you know that 80% of people that come to church come because of somebody in the church that invited them? 80%. 80%. There are some people here today. You're here today because someone in this church witnessed to you. They shared the gospel with you, and that's why you're here. And that's what God uses. 
And again, that's why God left you here. That's why he left me here in this world. We're to shine his lights. We're to show the character of God. And we are to hold forth the gospel. We are to share the word of life. But again, if we're complaining, that is going to destroy our ability to witness. And so notice what Paul says in verse 16. Verse 16. He said, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. This would be the next reason why we shouldn't complain. Complaining discourages your co-laborers. It discourages your co-laborers. Paul says, I want to rejoice in the day of Christ that I haven't run or labored in vain. And again, he's switching metaphors here. He used the metaphor of a child with a father. He used the metaphor of, a, of lights in a dark world, the stars. Now he's using the illustration of a runner in a race. And, and that's what we are. We're all running in a race. And Paul says, I don't want to run this race in vain. What he has the idea of is kind of the, uh, the, the relay race. One time I was watching the U.S. compete in the Olympics uh, this years ago. They were the favorite to win the four by 100 meter relay race. And the first three U.S. runners uh, put the team ahead. They were way ahead of all the other competition. But when they, would, when they exchanged the baton, the last runner in the race dropped the baton. And they were disqualified. And you know what that meant? The previous runners who ran, they ran the race in vain. And that's what Paul's saying here. Look, I don't want to run my race in vain. I've given you the gospel. I share with you the word of God. Now it's your job to hold forth the word of life. And I want, to, I want you to make sure you're doing that because I don't want to run this race in vain. I don't want the investment that I get, gave to you in the gospel and the word of God to be for nothing. And if we're not holding forth the word of life, if we're not being lights in this dark world, if we're not being joyful believers even in the midst of difficulty, there's a sense in which we're dropping the baton. And Paul says, I've run this race in vain. I don't want to run the race in vain. So complaining will wear away on those that are around you, those that are your co-laborers. And Paul says, I don't want to run this race in vain. So stop complaining. Let me give you the last thing quickly. Complaining dishonors your father. It dims your testimony, destroys your witness, discourages your co-laborers. But the last thing, it diminishes your sacrifice. Look in verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. In other words, again, Paul's in prison. He knows that he could go before Caesar. Caesar could choose to put him to death. If that's what happens, Paul says, if I'm going to be poured out on the altar, I rejoice about that. And what he was talking about was the libation offering. What is that? Sometimes when a worshiper would bring their sacrifice to the altar, and the animal was on fire, they would take a, a cup of wine and pour it on the altar that was already hot with fire, and instantly that liquid would, would be consumed and become like smoke. And, and it, it was kind of a very demonstrative type offering as if to say, I'm pouring my life out for you, God. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Look, if God so chooses in his wisdom to take my life, and I'm poured out upon the altar, if I have to die... For the name of Christ. Even in that, Paul said, I don't, I don't complain. In fact, I rejoice. I rejoice. I joy and rejoice that God is going to use my life to magnify his name. Even if it means by my death, I rejoice in that. That's a choice. So you can choose either to complain about your circumstance or you can rejoice in what God is doing in your life even to the point of sacrificing your life for Christ. If that's what God calls upon you to do, then you should be filled with joy. Just like Paul says here, I rejoice in that. Now look at verse 18. This is the invitation. Here's the last part. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Paul says to this little church, worried, filled with anxiety, some of them complaining about their circumstance, Paul says, look, I'm calling upon you to change your attitude and to joy and rejoice with me. I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining that I'm in prison, that I could die. I rejoice in whatever God chooses to do. And I am calling upon you, I'm asking you to choose to rejoice with me. 
So I would just end the sermon by saying this today. Choosing to not complain is a choice on your part. And choosing to rather rejoice also is a decision that you make. It's a decision to trust in God's sovereign wisdom in your life that God knows what he's doing. And when he puts you through difficulties and hardships and trials, he has a good purpose in mind for you ultimately at the end. And that's a matter where you have to just trust God. So you can choose to either complain. And if you do complain, it's only going to hurt you. It's only going to cause your anxiety to soar. It's only going to cause a vicious cycle of negativity in your life. Or you can choose to say, you know what? I'm not complaining. I choose to trust God. I choose to rejoice. Replace your complaining with rejoicing. Let me just read this to you in closing. There's a family nobody likes to meet. They live, it is said, on Complaining Street. It's in the city of never are satisfied, the river of discontent beside. They growl at that. They growl at this. Whatever comes, there is something amiss. And whether their station be high or humble, they all are known by the name of grumble. The weather is always too hot or cold. The summer and winter alike they scold. Nothing goes right with folks you meet down on that gloomy complaining street. They growl at the rain. They growl at the sun. In fact, their growling is never done. And if everything pleased them, there isn't a doubt, they growl that they had nothing to grumble about. And the worst thing is that if anyone stays amongst them too long, he will learn their ways. And before he dreams of the terrible jumble, he's adopted into the family of grumble. So it were wisest to keep our feet from wandering into complaining street and never to growl whatever we do, lest we be mistaken for grumblers too. Let us learn to walk with a smile and song, no matter if things do sometimes go wrong, and then be our station higher humble, will never belong to the family of grumble. Are there any family of grumble here this morning? It's a choice. Thank you for that testimony, brother. <laughs> it's a choice that uh, we make to never complain, but to replace complaining with rejoicing. Can you imagine Jesus ever complaining? The Bible says that for the joy that was set before him, he went to the cross. He went to the cross not complaining. He went to the cross with joy. Why? Because it was for you. He was going to take your sins upon himself. He was going to die for you, for your sins. And if Jesus went to the cross with joy, is it too much to ask if you bear your cross with joy for him? Let's bow for prayer together. Well, heads bowed and eyes closed. I just want you to do business with the Lord right there where you are. Maybe there's some folks here that need to confess before the Lord and ask for his forgiveness for complaining, for grumbling. Ask God to replace that spirit of complaining with joy. We have so much to be thankful for, so much to rejoice in and what God has done in our life. Ask God to make you shine like a light in a dark world. To be blameless and harmless, the children of God in the midst of a, a twisted and perverse generation all over this sinful world. God has left us to be his light, to be blameless, harmless children of God, not to be complainers. Ask God to make you that light wherever you are. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I would just exhort you, get that matter settled. Today, right where you are, reach out in faith and say, Lord Jesus, I know you died for my sins. Save me. Come into my heart. Be my Savior, Lord Jesus. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me. Is there anyone here say, that's my prayer, preacher? I want to pray for you. Anyone here? You don't know the Lord. You're not absolutely certain. Would you be willing to... Say, right now, I'm trusting Christ and Christ alone. Anyone here, I want to pray for you. I want to help you. All right. Father, bless your word to hearing hearts here today. May we apply it for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name.